So Xenoblade Chronicles Mm -hmm. has, in my opinion, or at least up to this interview, has to be probably your most ambitious Let's Play. And uh, first off, it has the most episodes. And it's probably fair to say that it was probably your toughest 100% walkthrough to make. Mm -hmm. Um, So what did you do to prepare for this LP specifically? Okay, this one was in development for about... I think it was like two and a half years before it actually like began releasing episodes. Um, what I did was there was no walkthrough on the internet that had all the information in one place that I wanted to go over in the series. There were some that would say, okay, this quest is in this location at this time, but it wouldn't be very specific on the location. And it wouldn't mention which characters add text to the quest if you do it. There's other ones that would mention that they would add text and it would say what place it was, but then the time might not be... Like, it was weird. Right. There was a lot of things like that, and the thing that was by and large across all of these walkthroughs was that they would list the item that you needed or whatever, but they wouldn't tell you the locations of the item, and if they did, they'd only say one or the other, like trading or monsters or not both. What I did was I took, I think, three different walkthroughs of the game, as well as the Xenoblade wiki, uh, took information from all those, cross-checked them against each other, and I wrote my own text walkthrough internally that was covered the entire game. I cataloged every single quest in this text document. Then once I had done that, I went through all the prerequisites to all the quests, figured out, okay, this quest chain, you can begin it now, but you can't go back and finish it until later. For the sake of making the videos easier to follow, and so a quest chain would be gone over in full in a video, I would be like, okay, on this visit to this area, we can complete these quest chains. Then I put them in the order that would be most convenient to complete them in. Because with this being such a long game, little time saves like that do make a big difference with it being a 100 plus part series. Did all that. uh, A lot of cases I had to do my own research on trading items, on what enemies could do them, what the easiest enemy that could drop an item was, because sometimes they could be obtained from many different sources. Um, Did all that. Play tested it through a few different times, despite how big of a game it was. And then once I had the general order of which I was showing everything locked down, I contacted some other people and I had them play through the game, not only to further test the route that I had put together, but basically so they could make all the opposite decisions of what I was making and record their playthrough in the process. Then they would send all those files to me. So I would have footage of multiple complete playthroughs. I'd be able to show what would happen if you made decisions that I didn't. I was wondering about that. So I did that. Then when it came to actually recording, uh, there were a lot of little things that went into it creatively. There was showing alternate routes of things that you could do, uh, wanting to not cut down exploration because it's such a big part of the game. Um, There was one thing that was always big was mentally being ready with follow-up topics in case I'd finished talking about everything I wanted to talk about before reaching our destination because of just how long it could go on for at times. When it came to commentating certain things, there, there were parts of it that were more complicated. Like when I was going over equipment spreads and things like that, I might do those in post, but it was mostly live commentary like it usually is. I I think in an earlier part, we went over post versus live and like when I do post and that kind of thing. There were a lot of little creative decisions that I had made, like um, in addition to doing quests when they'd be most convenient, I also did them when they would make the most sense from a story perspective. So we'd revisit locations typically when there was a break in the story or whenever the story required us to go back to an earlier area. Um, There'd be other things like getting a party member trained up so they could fight alongside the rest of us. Um... There was the fact that a lot of there was a lot of side quests that expand on details of the story, and I made sure to do those at times where they made the most sense. So it would be like telling one big story across the story cutscenes and the side quests. Um, another little creative decision that I did with the commentary is you'll notice if you go back and watch that um, there's whenever I come back from a cutscene, I never begin my commentary by saying like okay or well or so or anything like that. I keep the momentum going. That was something that I decided that I wanted to do early on because I noticed that a lot of um, a lot of commentary comes back very slow from a cutscene, where they'll begin with a word like "okay" or something like that. I didn't. I personally didn't want to do that. My notes for that series are about 260 pages. Ooh. So that should give you an idea how much went into that. Um, I feel like that should be a throne controller's prize. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the root itself? 
Yeah, the official strategy guide for 100% Xenoblade. There is no English strategy guide, so I was also alone on that front. That's very true. And then the one they made for X apparently isn't very good. Oh, it's awful. They, um... Yeah. I'm trying to think of other stuff that I did. Um, there was the fact that I showed unreleased content. Uh, up to that point, it hadn't been cataloged that these unused items had, like, full translated item descriptions and all that, so I was able to show that off for the first time. Uh, there was the fact that I um, I contacted a friend of mine that's a professional translator. He translated interviews that people outside Japan had never seen before. There's um, an extra bit of story that was told in a Japanese book of, like, an art book based... Um, sorry. The Japanese art book of Xenoblade Chronicles has a bit of additional story that it tells in, like, a novelization. I had that fully translated. So it was the first time that people outside of Japan had seen a full translation to that. Only the core details of what happened in it were known to American gamers before that point. So there were a lot of little things like that. There were, There's probably a lot of other things I don't think of. Uh, one thing that I don't think I ever told publicly was there's times where there's ancient languages inscribed on, like, stone tablets in some of the middle areas of the game. I actually tried to see if that was a decipherable language. I contacted language professors at some universities. Um, there was there was some kind of uh, writing recognition script that can crack codes that I found on the internet that I was using with that. I used a few of those, actually, by putting the characters into it, seeing if it could come up with anything. Ultimately, it, I poured a lot of time into it for it not to be an actual language. Um, it was found that it repeated symbols too often for it to actually like have any comprehensive language in it. But I was able to find that it was inspired by Arabic, at least, because there's a lot of nuances in the writing that are very similar to Arabic. Oh, cool. I'm trying to think if there's like any other like little stories. Um, oh, before it came out, I thought for sure it was going to flop terribly because nobody would be interested, and I was really just doing it because I thought it would make for a good series and because it was something that I personally really wanted to do. Right. So there was a lot of anxiety leading up to the release, though, because it was going to go on for so long, and I thought it was just going to be this thing that nobody liked. 